Okay, hello everyone. And welcome everyone to the 2020 APEC Groundbreakers Virtual Tour by APEC OUC. This year, our event will be the biggest, uh, biggest one ever done with 174 sessions, including normal sessions, workshops, and hands-on labs from 123 different speakers over 11 days. Also, it will cover different uh, sessions on four different languages. And please remember to register to as many sessions you can. And our sessions will be available to replay as many times you want for two weeks after the initial session date and time. You can also interact with the speaker at any time during that two weeks by posting questions or comments directly in the playback session page of this session. I would like to say thanks to our Oracle user groups and Java user groups that made this event possible and also to our sponsors, Oracle Groundbreakers and CloudDB. Now for today's session, what I wish I knew about Maven years ago by Andres Almirai. Please feel free to write questions at any time during this session at the Q&A tab of the Zoom webinar and the speaker will be answering them at the end of the session. If any issues during the presentation, please feel free to contact me as the moderator at any time on the chat tab of the Zoom webinar. Now, without any more delays, I would like to leave you with this amazing session by Andreas Almirai. Thank you very okay. much for the, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, so I'm going to share the screen in just a second and play the slides. Here we go. So what I wish I knew about maybe years ago, and uh, well, this is me, I'm Andres Almirai, um, I work for Oracle, and I love talking about open source and uh, how to build stuff. And that's the reason why I'm here with you. And if you have any questions, please let me know at any time and I will do my best to answer them at, uh, at the end of the session. So I will expect that most of you are Java developers and you may be aware that uh, Java uh, when it was announced 25 years ago, it was done so in such a way that the, uh, the syntax of the language was very close to what at the time was the most popular language, C. That allowed uh, the vast majority of developers to jump from C language to Java language because the syntax is very similar. Now, because of the same reasons, many of the tools that existed for the, the C language were used for Java. So, how, what tools did we use to build Java projects besides the Java compiler was, was pretty, pretty much make. But Java also added another feature or, or another um, new thing, which is called write once, run anywhere. The idea was that you will write your programs in one platform, compile it, and then just run it in any other platform. In this case, the build tool make wasn't really very much portable. So we needed something that will cater for Java projects. And uh, the, the open source projects started to flourish in the Java ecosystem. And Tomcat was one of the earliest open source projects. And it required a build tool, you know, the, again, for, to publish two different platforms. So that's how the Apache and project came to be. This this project, uh, whether you like or you hate XML, that's not exactly the point. The point is that it really provides us with a platform agnostic way to build tools uh, or build projects in Java. And that enables to write large projects. But at some point, developers saw that, well, it, it didn't give us much, uh, many things in order to build very complex projects. So, so a group of team developers decided to go back to the drawing board and created Maven, which gave us dependency resolution and conventions and a few other things. And that in turn allowed us to create even more complex projects. And about 2007, another group of developers saw that while Maven was okay, there were some issues with the project, the way that the other tool uh, build projects and by basically your project had to bend to the build tool instead of the other way around. And this team of developers decided to create another build tool called Gradle. 
Now, this is about 2008, uh, early 2009, when I jumped from Maven to Gradle, and I spent the next 10 years working with Gradle. And in the last year, I came back to Maven because having gained all that uh, knowledge on different build tools, I thought that, well, I missed completely the launch of Maven 3, which happened in 2010. So what if there were some other features provided by this build tool that made uh, building projects much easier again with Maven. So this talk is based on that, on the experiences so looking at different build tools and then coming back to Maven and see what actually makes it tick. So one of the first prop things that we're going to see, and I will expect that you may be familiar with some of these uh, features. Yeah. If so, please let me know. So the first one is the override project properties. You may be aware that you can define properties in a couple of ways. You can define a properties block on a POM file and put pretty much any key value pair that you want. Plugins can also define properties. Uh, they do this by exposing fields annotated with an annotation called add parameter. And when that happens, uh, there is an associated property name with that field. And that will allow you to override or provide a value for that field using either the direct field access in the configuration uh, block of the plugin or using the, uh, the property. So I'm going to show you a quick demo of this. I'm going to jump into the terminal. And uh, I have a simple project here that looks like this. Is a regular POM file that has a GAP coordinates. GAP stands for Group ID, Artifact ID, and Version. It has a simple dependency. And uh, I believe it has just a single class file, sample.java. Perfect. So the latest version of Maven, I believe, is version 3.6.3. And uh, that, that's the version that I'm running. And I have Java 1.8 also currently selected. Okay, so if I were to compile my code and um, I will expect my class files to be uh, Java 8, isn't it? So let's quickly inspect the generated bytecode and then grab it for the major number. And that should give us the number that matches uh, the current version of Java. Major version 49. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but 49 is definitely not Java 8. 49 is, as a matter of fact, Java 5. What's going on? Maven has a series of defaults and the, when, when you build your projects. And the default for running Maven is Java 5. So how can we change this? Well, we could define in our POM file the, the Maven compiler plugin and the pass properties for the, the source and the target, or we could define in the properties block, the, the source and the target, or even better, we can pass it on the command line. So we can say something like this. Actually, let's do uh, just make sure that we have a clean and uh, we define the uh, property Maven compiler target equals 1.8 and then run the build and then check again the compile code. And we get now major version 52, which matches uh, Java 8. Now, every single property that is exposed through your POM file or the build or the plugins can be overridden using the minus the command flag. And this will come back later in the presentation. The next thing that I really like is the fact that you can invoke any Maven plugin on the command line just by passing the gap coordinates and the goal and any additional parameters. So we typically configure plugins in our POM files, but you can also do things like this. Say, for example, for the echo plugin, if I wanted to, to um, invoke that particular version, well, we have the gap coordinates, the echo uh, goal, and we can pass additional parameters. Again, the echo.message is a property exposed by a field in the, in the Echo plugin. Let's see that in action. Uh, this particular class that I have in this uh, project, I believe is an executable class. It looks like this. So I will be able to run this. And um, 
I do have a couple of command files to exemplify this. The first command is this. I'm going to run this class passing the exec maven plugin on the command line. Notice that I use the gap coordinates plus the argument here. So I can execute this like this, uh, a little cat into shell or whatever it is. Whoop, command one. Uh, sorry, that's the silly thing to do. This one. Oh, what am I doing wrong? There we go. So that executes Maven, compiles and run, we get a hello world. Perfect. Now, there is a subset, or actually there's a set of plugins that are that belong to a specific group or, or actually a group ID, which is or Apache Maven plugins. And there's another one called Org Mojo House. And in this is the case, then your plugins can be executed without passing the full gap coordinates. Such is the case for the exec plugin. If we look at the command line before, that belongs to the Oracle House module. This is one of the projects, not on the group IDs. Now you could change this if you want to. It's configurable in Maven by passing additional settings in the uh, uh, plugin groups, if I'm not mistaken. But for now, let's let's use the second command. So that will be executing command number two. And we get the same result. Now for the echo uh, plugin. And this is the other command that I want to use. It passes the gap coordinates for the echo plugin. So you can see the group ID, artifact, version, go, echo, and parameters. So let's execute this and now. And you will notice that Maven downloads the echo plugin because I didn't have it on my local Maven uh, repository. And when it executes the echo go, we get the, uh, what we suspected, hello world from echo plugin. And then we run this command again you notice that the download does not happen anymore because, because the plugin is again now in my local repository. All right, let's continue. So I rem remembered when I said that Maven gave us uh, new features um, on top of what Ant provided before. And one of them is dependency resolution, which is uh, one of the best things that ever happened to Maven and probably also one of the worst. It's a double edged sword because it is. It, is, it causes some trouble. And the reason being is that the, uh, the rules for dependency resolution are different depending whether you have a direct dependency, that is a dependency that is explicitly defined in your POM file, or a transitive dependency, which happens to be a dependency that belongs to the transitive closure of your direct dependencies. So when you have a direct dependency, the rules are the, um, the dependency that is if it's found explicitly directly in your POM file, then that is the one that's going to win. If it's not there, then it's going to search into the parent hierarchy, maybe your parent, your grandparent, all the way to the super parent POM. And if it's found explicitly in one of those POMs, then it's going to be the chosen one. And that's it. But if it happens to be a transitive uh, dependency, then it depends the location of the, trans, uh, the dependency in the graph and how many hops you have to go to reach that dependency. So say you may have the same group ID, artifact ID in different locations in your graph with uh, two, one, 10 hops. And each one of these dependencies, even though they share the same group ID, artifact ID, they have different versions. But it doesn't matter that one of those will be a higher version or lower version. It is the one that is closest or the nearest one that is going to win. And that's how Maven works. So a few months ago in March, I, I launched um, a quiz on dependency resolution in Maven and it contains a handful of questions. So I'm just going to show you two of them. The first one, uh, this, is, this is quite a, like an interesting question, is that what happens in your POM file when you have two direct dependencies that have the same group ID, artifact ID, but different version? Uh, if I resolve dependencies from Maven here, uh, what's going to happen? Is it going to be the first one? Is it going to be the second one, the one selected? Or is this going to be some sort of error? Because well, clearly you shouldn't have dependencies defined like this. Well, if when you run this in the command line, 
Notice that I'm using the command dependency tree. This is actually the dependency plugin, which belongs to our Apache Maven plugin. So that's why I don't have to run it with the full GAF coordinates. So here I'm running a plugin that is never that is not applied to my pom file, and that is and that's one of the things that you can do with Maven. Okay, so this plugin is going to resolve my dependencies, and it tells me that there is a warning. Something is odd here. We have two versions for the same group ID artifact ID. Just watch that. But Maven does continue and let us build. So when we resolve the dependencies, so happens that the chosen one is the latest. And that is not because that is the biggest one. It's because it's the last one that was defined in the POM file. So in direct dependencies, the last one and, and the closest one is the one that's going to be chosen. Let's turn this over to transitive dependencies. Google Juice and Google Truth both depend on Guava. And both of them have a one hop uh, route to Guava. Now the version that Guava of Guava that Juice depends on is version um, 25. And true depends on Guava version 27. Now, which version is going to be chosen? Is it going to be 25? Is it going to be 27? Is it going to be a build error? Now, if we were to follow the same rules as transitive dependencies, we would probably think, oh, it's going to be version 27. Well, so when we run this again with dependency tree, notice that the chosen version is actually 25 because that was the first one that was found. Let me show you that running. So we go here into transitive one. And here's the POM file. We have juice and truth. And when I resolve this with dependency tree, we get that the chosen version is actually version 25. So let's turn this around. Let's switch the order. Now let's put truth first and just second. We invoke the same command as before, dependency tree. And what we get now is that Guava 27 is the one that is chosen. So proving again that the, the place of a transitive dependency in the graph affects the dependency resolution. Now, is there a way to fix this? Is there a way that we can say uh, we want a specific version to be chosen? But first, we have to recall something. We have to remember that Maven does not follow semantic versioning, even though we as human as developers, we think it should. So this is Robert Schulter. He is the Apache Maven PMC chair. So he is the leader of the project at this time. And he said this, Maven never looks at the dependency version. It only looks at the location of the dependency in the graph. And based on that, it will know uh, which uh, actual dependency is going to be resolved. Now, this decision was made many years ago, and it's probably not a good time to rethink the, the, the resolution strategy for Maven. So this is something that we might see differently in the next major version of Maven. Is there a way that we can fix this? Yeah, one of the reasons, one of the things that we could do is use the dependency management block in this case, which works like a yeah, lookup table. If, well, so when Maven tries to resolve a dependency, it will try, it will look for the group ID and artifact ID in this dependency management table. And if it matches a group ID and artifact ID, then it's going to use a supply version. So in this case, it's version 28. Now, if I jump back again into the uh, terminal and change to these other projects and I show you the POM file, here I have version 29 in the dependency management block. And again, truth and juice. It doesn't matter which order truth and juice are, are defined. So let's see this. Let's resolve dependencies like we did before. And what happens now with this dependency management block is that the chosen version is 28. Again, it doesn't matter which order the dependencies are defined. It doesn't matter how many hops are there in the graph to find the dependency. If there is a match between the group ID and the active ID, then the specific version is going to be chosen. 
Another thing that we could do is apply the Maven Enforcer plugin uh, that has a really nice tag, which is the loving Iron Fist of Maven. Because the moment that you configure the Enforcer plugin in your build is certainly bound to break. Because we think that we know Maven, we think that we have configured Maven, but actually the Maven Enforcer plugin will tell us that yeah, maybe there are a few things that are not really working properly. One of the rules that Enforcer plugin has is called um, uh, dependency conversions, which will force every single de transitive dependency to follow the same version. In this case, if we configure the rule, our build will break because we'll have two different versions of Guava. I also asked on Twitter many months ago if, if uh, people use the Enforcer plugin, and sadly, even though this is not very scientific fault, uh, not that many people know what the Enforcer plugin is. And for those that do, they don't use it. I highly recommend you to have a look at the Enforcer plugin. If you're interested to know more about the quiz, here's the URL that contains the results. This is the distribution of the, of the 500 entries, people that res, uh, respond in the quiz. And only uh, it's only a few people that actually got most questions right. Only seven people got it right. And I, not even I got all the questions right. So that this was kind of like an interesting result. There are a few other graphs in the results here. Question number one and question number five are those questions that I show you. And uh, the first uh, group is for just a palm with dependencies, direct and transitive. The second group is where we introduce a palm palm. And the third group is when we introduce a BOM file. And so we can see that when parm and bombs are in, added into the mix, then the developers were not really sure what would be the answer of Maven, but we are mostly sure when it's just a single BOM file. If you have ever encountered problems with uh, resolving class paths with Maven, and uh, I will certainly encourage you to have a look at this presentation again from Robert and Ray, both the Java champions. The, uh, the URL is right there at the bottom that contains the link to the video and the slides and additional content from, from both Robert and Ray. And uh, one of the things that they display or they showcase is the enforcer plugin and the dependency management block, but there are all the use cases that will, uh, that will probably arise in, in dependency uh, uh, class path hell. And uh, they will show you how you can solve these things. All right, here's another interesting bit. Maybe in clean store, it's probably the favorite combine that we use to build projects. Well, I'm here to tell you that Maven clean install is a cargo code and should be avoided as much as you can. There are still valid use cases for clean install, but not all the use cases that we probably use them today. Another way to see this is, well, the first rule of Maven Club is you to not invoke Maven clean install. As you probably know, the second rule is you definitely do not invoke Maven clean install. Instead, use Maven Verify. Or if you want to, Maven Verify will give rainbows to your builds. What's going on? There's a little bit of history, but basically in Maven 2, we needed to use Maven Clean Store because the, the Maven, when building multi projects, was not aware of what is known as the reactor. The reactor is this feature that builds all the projects within a single Maven session. In Maven 3, this changed. So the reactor can put the generated artifacts, so all the jars for all your projects into the Maven session that it will become available to other projects within the session. So if you're building a multi-project build and you, every time you keep doing clean stall, clean stall, what you're, what's happening is that you are deleting computed resource, the, the jars and the classes and the process resources. So you're paying the price for recomputing all those resources all over and again, defeating uh, incremental builds, but also when install happens, we are copying files into the uh, Maven local repository and we are polluting our local repository with artifacts that shouldn't be there. And it's just a tiny fraction of time that we also spend copying files to something that shouldn't be there. Now Maven Verify does everything for you. And there is a um, a um, video presentation from Robert explaining the reasons behind Maven Cleanstall, the historical reasons of why it was, what, how it was, when it was designed, 
And once Maven 3 came out RAM, why it would be a good idea to switch to Maven Verify. Here's another one. Invoking a subset of the reactor. This is a really cool feature. Yeah, there it doesn't have a real name per se. I would call it partial execution or sub reactor. Basically, when you run a multi project build, uh, the Maven session contains all the projects, and this is known as the Maven reactor. Now, the reactor executes every goal for projects. So if you say something like uh, Maven compile, Maven compile is actually a lifecycle phase. But if you say compile at the top of a multi-project build, it is going to execute compile for every sub-project. But if you just want to build a subset of all the reactor, then you can pass the dash PL, which stands for project list, and a list of paths, which have, uh, stand for the, the projects that you want to be built. And then only those projects will be built. But what happens if though any of those projects have dependencies to its siblings? Then those siblings will not be in the sub-reactor. In order to make sure that you have the, the minimum set of projects that can be built, then you also need to pass the AM flag, which stands for also make. And this will build your projects in the list plus all the prerequisites for those projects to be built. So let me show you that. Uh, we go into Pasha number one, and um, let's see. Uh, I hope that I have anything about, yes, I have something about. So let's clean this so we don't have anything. And then let's do a tree. And we see that we have a root pom file here that is the, the root of our build. And we have four projects, one, two, three, and four, and each one of them have Java sources. So when we look at the root here, it has the gap coordinates and four modules. Yep, just a standard uh, aggregator uh, pump. And then if we look at project one, the pump, it's just gap coordinates and the reference to a sparent. When we look at two, I believe has gap coordinates, the parent and the dependency to one. When we look at three, I believe it has a dependency on two. And when we look at four, then we have no other dependency. So if we were just to do compile here, notice that at the beginning, we got a summary of their reactor, five projects, the root, and project one to four. And then we get a summary of what was built, right? Okay, now let's invoke a sub reactor. Let's do a clean, just to be sure that there's nothing here, nothing under my sleeves. And I'm going to, I want to just build project three. Remember that that depends on two, which depends on one. So I say, let's build project three and let's do compile, right? And it breaks, why? because it does not find the jar file for, um, for project two. Hmm. What happens if we do verify? With, we, I say something that verify will make this work. Let's try it again. And continues to fail. The reason being is the missing AM flag. So if I invoke now this with dash AM, notice what happens. The sub reactor contains only four projects. Project four is not needed. And then, wow, this works. Perfect. Okay, so now that I did a verify, um, and I know that project three is an executable class, we know that we can invoke any plugin from the command line, like exec Java. We can pass parameters like exec main class, and uh, like this. And the class I believe is come at me sample. Let's do this. And we got a failure. What is going on here? It says the build did not find come at me sample. Wait a second. Why is the exec maven plugin being invoked on the root? I just wanted to invoke it in project tree. Hmm. What's going on here? Well, if you remember, I said that every goal is invoked for every project in the reactor. Now, the root project, which is just an aggregator, 
doesn't have any classes. Of course, it's going to fail. So what can we do to fix this? Well, um, you will probably have, in this case, to define the plugin at the root level using the plugin management block and apply it. Sometimes you will have to define dummy values for some of the properties. And most importantly, it will be a good idea to apply the plugin in a disabled state. Most plugins have a skip property that will help you in this regard. So you go back to the demo and uh, now let's change into the, the version that works. Let's do a clean here just uh, in case that there's nothing there. This is the same structure that we saw earlier, root project and four sub projects, right? It's actually come back to me main now, the remote. Now let's look at pom file here of the root. We define two properties with magic names. This magic name matches the properties exposed by the exec plugin, so skip and main class. We have plugin management block here defining the exec maven plugin, all right? We apply the exec maven plugin. That means that it's going to be applied to the root and every child project as well. But because we have exec skip equals true, that means that this, the plugin, even though it's going to be available in the configuration of each project, is not going to be executed. But we want it to be executed on project three, right? So let's look at the POM file for project team, project three. In this case, we do define the value for the exact main class, which is the one that, that should be available. And we have to redefine the application of the exact Maven plugin. And in this case, we pass skip false. So this means the exact plugin should be invoked. Okay. So with this now, I can do maven am pl project tree, just a sub reactor, use verify and exec Java. I no longer have to define the parameter for exec main class because it's now found in the POM file. Okay, so when we do this, we have a sub reactor, the root and the four on the three projects, Notice that the execution on the, on the root is a skipped. Then the execution on plugin on project one is a skip as well. We turn it to project two. The execution is a skipped as well. Then we turn it to project three and the execution happens. And this is exactly what we want with our configuration. Next, we turn it to aggregating pumps, which we kind of seen already. And it's basically an aggregating palm is just like any other palm that contains a modules section. Now we typically see this with parent palms, but an aggregating palm does not have to be a parent palm. It's just something that contains modules. And by the way, modules, the definitions are paths. They are not project names. It is the convention in Maven that your projects are found in directories adjacent to the aggregator. But your project could be in many directories deep into the structure, in which case you will have to use the full path, well, actually the relative path. So let me show you something. Say, for example, uh, and this is not really a good idea with these names. Let's jump into the demo. And um, that demo is in the aggregator. All right. So we have something that looks like this. Let's do a clean so that we don't have that many directories, many files. So we have something like this. Say you have your project, it's called my project, and you had a dependency on common slang. This is Apache common slang. Now there is a bug in common slang. Mm. And um, so what can we do to fix this in your project? Well, you download common slang, you clone the repository, you fix the bug, push uh, an intermediate uh, artifact into your local repository or your remote artifact manager, and then test out your project and you figure out, oh, I, the bug was not fixed correctly. And then you iterate and iterate, but this takes time because you're interactive with that repository. You can make these things faster 
by combining common slang and your project into a single multi-project build. And this is done thanks to an aggregator pump. So the aggregator looks like this. Just any gap coordinates will suffice and they, they are not important. What is important is that it contains the two modules, the thing that you want to fix and the consumer, in this case, my project. Uh, for this fake common length project, uh, it just has gap coordinates and just put 99 because in that way it's not going to, to clash with anything that exists out there in, in Maven Central and just in case that there is, happens to be some written dependency resolution. And my project looks like this. Uh, my own GARP coordinates, notice that none of these two projects refer to the aggregator. There is no parent here. And my project depends on common slang version 99. Right. So now if I do this, Maven verify, notice that my aggregator builds common slang and builds my project. If I were to run, if I well, actually verify runs my test and does packaging and everything, well, if there were any tests, something will be run here. So in this, in this way, I can fix the problem in common slang and iterate much faster and testing that, oh, my project that consumes this com version of common slang is doing things properly. And so now I will say that I have fixed the problem and I can send pull requests to wherever the places that I, that I need to be sent. So that was the demo. Uh, finally, BOM files. BOM files are BOM are BOM files that contain other dependencies. The important bit in a BOM file is the dependency management block, and you're supposed to define all the. If you're in a multi-project build, then you define all the modules in your multi-project build that you want to expose, and uh, you can add additional dependencies. For example, in this case, I'm adding Guava, even though there's only a single one. This is a very silly and trivial BOM file but just to exemplify this. And that's it. Basically, you put as many um, gap coordinates as you want. When you consume the bomb, you do it in this way. You put also in your consumer a dependency management block. And uh, you have to have two additional things that are quite important. The first is the type of the dependency it has to be pump. So otherwise, maybe we'll think there is a jar associated with these coordinates, which in, in this case is definitely not. And you also have to say that the scope is import. And this is the case. What Maven is going to do is download that particular POM file, read the dependency manager block that con is containing that POM file, and import all those dependencies into this block as if all those dependencies were written in your consumer block. That's the whole reason why we're doing import. Once you do that, Again, because we have a dependency management block that has matches groups and artifacts like these, as we saw earlier, we can put a dependency on Guava by just defining the group ID and the Actify ID. We can omit the version because the dependency management block, this lookup table, is going to provide the version for us. And that's pretty much it. So there are a few more things that uh, can be learned about Maven. But if you are coming from Gradle or from Ant, know that there are features that are, are familiar uh, coming from those uh, build tools. There are other things that are unique to Maven. For example, running the, the plugins, uh, any plugin on the command line is pretty much unique for the time being. And, uh, and a few other things that happen as well. Yeah, I've got a few resources for you. Uh, I've got a running series called Mastering Maven, the series on the Oracle blocks. And uh, there is another series by a Java champion called Shanda Gunter, uh, Understanding Apache Maven. And uh, if you happen to use Gradle and you want to use some of these features, well, there is a series of plugins that give you some of these features for Gradle. And uh, I think this is pretty much what I, in terms of content that I have for you now, we still have time for questions if you have them. So let me turn into the, the chat. Um, are there any questions? Or should I browse to the website, I believe? In case uh, there are any questions online. Uh, Francisco. 
Or, well, if, if there are not any questions at this moment, uh, that's right. And uh, Hey, Andreas, how are yeah? you? Yes. Sorry. Uh, yes, I cannot see any questions in the Q&A in this moment. If anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to post in the Q&A. Also, this session will be posted to be played back for two weeks after today in the playback tab of the hey summit of the conference that means anyone watching this the recording of this session afterwards can also apologies for the dogs and um, you can post your questions to the speaker anytime uh, over there and then the speaker will receive notifications mm -hmm. yes All i'm right. not seeing any question coming through on q a at the moment <laughs> That's all right. Well, so thank you everybody for uh, for being present here. And I, I felt to mention I'm streaming live from Switzerland. It's, uh, it's a little bit after five in the morning for me. In any case, I enjoy presenting and sharing content with you. Uh, feel free to reach out to me at any time. Um, every other speaker also as part of the Groundbreakers APAC tool. Uh, we have plenty of content for you and uh, well, keep enjoying this virtual tool, which is uh, quite an interesting experience. Thank you so much, Andres. It was a pleasure to have you here and thank you for sharing your knowledge with the community. Thank you, everybody. And uh, have a good day and, and an excellent week as well. Thank you, you too.